Hey everyone, welcome to Palmetto Hills Presbyterian Church. My name is Josh, I'm one of the pastors here. We're so glad that you can join us online for our worship service for August 9th, 2020. Our goal, our aim, our vision here at the church is to celebrate life in Christ by reaching out and building up for God's kingdom and God's glory. So let's prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. Our call to worship this morning uh, is taken from John 8, verse 12. We'll be using the series of I am statements from Jesus over the coming weeks uh, for our calls to worship. So hear the word of God this morning. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So as we consider Christ as the light, uh, let's sing together, To you, O Lord, I fly. together and ask him to meet us in worship this morning. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, you are merciful and slow to anger. You are abounding in steadfast love and kindness to us, your people. We pray, Lord, that as we gather this morning in different places, uh, Lord, even recognizing the, the realities of this current time, Lord, we praise you that you are ever-present with us, that you are everywhere and in all places. And we ask in particular this morning that you would dwell within us in a special way as we call upon your spirit to be with us in worship 
and that we ask, Lord, this morning that our worship would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort those uh, who are not with us this morning and that you would be with those uh, who weep. Uh, But we come to you, Lord, rejoicing because you call us into your presence, because you invite us to Mount Zion, and so we come with rejoicing and with singing this morning, and we come in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing together, like a river glorious, as we consider uh, this river flowing from the throne of God. Let's sing together, like a river glorious. Our call to confession this morning comes from John chapter 3, very familiar passage to us, beginning in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light came into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clear, clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Part of the glory and grace of the gospel is that God welcomes us into his presence to confess our sins to him. Let's pray together and ask God to be gracious to us and forgive us for our sins. Father, we come to you grateful for the reminder that our Lord Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We confess this morning that we often lose sight of your heart and your mission when we look at this lost and dying world. We confess that we're quick to judge, 
and not to show mercy. We're quick to move towards self-righteousness and not compassion. We rejoice in the light of your love and gospel and your grace, God, and help us to embrace the light and to shine your light into the darkness. And Father, even though we've seen the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, we confess that many times we're still drawn, we're still seduced, we're still tempted by the darkness and by sin. We think sin's promises are better. Forgive us, Lord, and give us joy and hope to walk by grace in your commandments. Help us to follow you in the light and not to walk in darkness. And teach us to pray, even as you, Lord Jesus, taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's respond by singing to God's glory. I will glory in my Redeemer. Let's sing. assurance of pardon comes from 1 John chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 2. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just 
to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. For all those who truly confess their sins, those promises are ours in Christ Jesus. We come to a time in the service where we give to the Lord as an act of worship, and you can give online through the PHPC website. You can also mail in a check to the church. Let's pray and ask God's blessing upon the offering. Father in heaven, we thank you again that you take care of us, you provide for us, you carry us through week by week, and we thank you that you've given us an opportunity through giving to help uh, worship you, to help deal with the anxieties and the fears that build up within us, that our giving is an act that you've called us to by grace. And so we pray for your mercy and your grace as we give. Use these gifts for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our sermon text this morning comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you have a Bible, please turn there with me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in this in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction." who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, but they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The scripture says of itself that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you, thankful for your word and for the privilege to study it, to hear it preached and proclaimed. I pray that you would guard my mouth, my tongue, my heart, to say only those things which are in accordance with your word and with your will. And I pray that you would open our hearts to see wonderful and glorious things from your law. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you guys remember when we couldn't find toilet paper? We would venture out each day on a quest. We waited in line outside of stores before they opened. One day I was driving past Dollar General and I saw someone walking out of the store with TP. And thankfully no one was behind me because I slammed on the brakes of my car, almost locking them up. I pulled in, mission accomplished. I texted my wife a victory photo of toilet paper. There seem to be a lot of things that are in short supply lately, and I'm talking about way more than TP and groceries. The pressures of the last few months have pushed and pulled and stretched us all in so many different ways. Church, school, sports, work, weddings, vacations, funerals, all impacted by what's happening. And the turmoil and confusion and fear and self-righteousness and anxieties and outrage, they press in on us. A general fatigue has set in, which often translates to a shortage of patience and wisdom and kindness and generosity and giving other people 
the benefit of the doubt. Maybe you understand what I'm saying. But here's the thing. We aren't the first folks who have been deeply, personally affected by what's going on in the world. We're not the first people to feel the pressures of life and of things that are happening that we really cannot control. Think about the Thessalonians. They were a young, growing congregation, even in the face of opposition. They were being persecuted. They were being imprisoned. They were going through the grinder in life. And in face of all of that, they endured. They persevered. They walked by faith in the present because they looked in faith to the future. How did they do that? It's because they had gospel hope, the theme of this series, gospel hope. But there was one area where they had their fair share of fears and questions. What about the order of the resurrection? What about the timing of the resurrection? What will it be like when Jesus comes back? When will it take place? Will we be ready? And even though Paul spoke to these questions in 1 Thessalonians, their fears lingered. It happens with all of us. And this passage is meant to calm their fears about the second coming of Christ, words about the future to help them have gospel hope for today. We have our fair share of anxieties about the future as well. Maybe not about the second coming, but we surely lie awake at night at times and we wonder how are things going to work out. What about my community and my future? What about my marriage? What about our children? What about school? What about mom and dad? Am I going to get laid off? What if I get sick? How difficult is the treatment going to be? Will we get through this? And here's what I want to suggest to you. We have gospel hope today because our sovereign Lord holds the future in his hands. And before we dive into this passage, there are a few things I want to say up front. You might call them disclaimers. First of all, if you're looking for a detailed outline of when and how and where Jesus is coming back, I'm going to go ahead and let you know that this sermon is going to deeply disappoint you. In my experience as a pastor for nearly 20 years, I've found that attempts to unlock the end time mysteries, bids to crack the code about Jesus' return, aren't often very helpful. And that's not our aim this morning. That's not our target. We are not seeking to solve the end times puzzle. Our goal is the same as Paul's gospel hope for today. Second, you already know this, but there are tons of opinions about the end times and the return of Christ. You may disagree with me. I may disagree with you, and that's okay. I think in this area, it's where this motto can be immensely helpful. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. What I'm saying may not fit into your end times grid, but we are committed to the following essentials. Jesus' bodily return. The resurrection of the dead, some to eternal life, some to eternal judgment. God establishing the new heavens and the new earth at the end. So let's look at our passage together. First of all, we see gospel hope for today. Don't be alarmed. How do we usually respond when someone says to us, don't be alarmed? We're alarmed. (laughs) What's wrong? But Paul's gospel hope for today, message begins with these words, don't be alarmed, don't be shaken. Look at verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you not to be quickly shaken in, shaken in mind or alarmed. Don't be afraid. They were worried. And what were they afraid about? They were afraid that they had missed out on the parousia, the return of Jesus. And Paul encourages them, he comforts them, he quiets their fears. I ask you, brothers and sisters, there's compassion and respect and that family of God connection. Don't be alarmed, don't be shaken, because people will try to deceive you. That's one of the things we see. One of the reasons they were afraid is because people were trying to deceive them. False teachers attacked that area in their lives that they knew was near and dear to the Thessalonian believers. 
the false teachers capitalized on their fears. And they said essentially, yeah, Jesus already come back, came back. You guys just must have missed it. And how does Paul deal with their fears? By teaching the word of God. By reminding them about the things that they already know from God. Look at verse 5. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? He reminds them, as he did in chapter 1, that Jesus' return is going to be so big and so glorious and so wonderful for the children of God that you cannot miss it. And we believe that what he describes in verse 1 of chapter 2, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5, in 1 Corinthians 15, in Acts chapter 1 and beyond, is that the return of Christ is one glorious, momentous event, not two or three. There'll be no secret about it. You can't miss it. And if you hear rumors or whispers that Jesus has come back, if someone speaks powerfully and persuasively about it, even if you get a letter claiming to be from us, don't be fooled, don't be duped. You've not missed out on the return of Jesus. Don't be alarmed. Those were their fears. What about our fears? We have gospel hope today because our sovereign God holds the future in his hand. And let's be honest. It's easy for us to be shaken and worried and alarmed in this world. Maybe it's not about Jesus' return, but there are plenty of things that stoke our fears. So much of our culture and media and politics are driven, they thrive on fear. And then we're confronted with our own failures and how powerless we are about so many things. And that's what's so encouraging and challenging for us about this passage and the situation of the Thessalonians. Even in the face of persecution and suffering, Paul tells them, don't be shaken, don't be alarmed. You can and should have gospel hope for today. And we have the same challenge and the same encouragement. And here are some of the things we need to remember. Just like them, today there are people, there are forces that are trying to deceive us as well. And you may not believe it, but it's true. And many of them are in the name of Christianity we think about the televangelist who says he needs us to send money so he can buy his new jet. We think about false teachers who teach a false gospel and say, you know what, how you live doesn't matter. You're forgiven. Do whatever you want. Or what you believe isn't really important. All roads lead to heaven. There are people seeking to deceive us. Or we can deceive ourselves unwilling through sinful actions and desires to be honest about ourselves, to honestly look at ourselves and reality and to listen to others. I've been there before in my life. And how do we combat those fears? How do we have gospel hope for today not being alarmed? Well, the solution is gospel hope through the word of God. We must remain rooted, connected, grounded, growing in gospel hope. We have to remember and ruminate, rest in the gospel daily. So many times our fears come out sideways as anger and bitterness and frustration and unkind words and actions or self-righteousness. Where and how do you need gospel hope for today in your life? Let me ask it this way. What are you afraid of? What gets you agitated, angry, frustrated, grumpy? What do you blow your top over? Those are all diagnostics like warning lights on the dashboard of our lives to help us get down to the deeper fears in order to give them to Jesus. We dig them up. We root them out. We can have gospel hope for today because our sovereign God holds the future in his hands. The second thing we see from this passage is that we can have gospel hope for today first things first. Part of Paul's encouragement and reassurance to the Thessalonians has to do with timing. He essentially says, you have not missed out on Christ's return because there are two things that must first take place. Look at verse 3. That day will not come unless the rebellion comes first 
and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Those things must take place. And we all know what Paul is talking about here, so let's move on to, to point three. Okay, that's a joke. We don't know exactly what's going on. There's been much debate, but let's take a look at these two things together. First of all, the rebellion. The root word here is apostasy. It can refer to a political crisis, but every time this word is used in the Bible, it has to do with a spiritual rebellion, an apostasy, abandoning the faith. The context text here about warnings of false teachers reinforces to us that this is talking about something that will happen in the covenant community of God, in the church. Don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid. Jesus won't come back until there is a massive decline in the church away from biblical Christianity, a departure from the faith. And Paul tells them this must take place first. And when he wrote to the Thessalonians, Christianity was still very young, 50, 51, 52 A.D. It was growing like wildfire. Think about it this way. Rebellion is at the heart of sin. It's essentially what we see unfold in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned against God. And the calling and encouragement for us here is to stand firm in the faith, to continue rooted, established, grounded in the word of God, and the gospel of grace. Because even though we believe in the perseverance and preservation of the saints, one of the signs, one of the indicators that we are God's children, that we are kept in gospel hope, is that we keep going, is that we endure believing, standing firm in the face of false teaching and false living. We need to be renewed and rooted in gospel hope for today, each and every day. Don't be deceived, don't be alarmed. First things first, the rebellion will come. And the message for us is this, by God's grace, don't be a part of it. Are there areas in your life where you sense drift? Where you recognize that you're moving in an unhealthy, unbiblical direction? Are there areas where you're hiding our calling, our privilege is to repent and enjoy refreshing in the Lord? And to the question of whether the rebellion has already happened, there have been massive departures in the church at large throughout history. You could make the case that this has happened. Has the rebellion, has the apostasy apostasy taken place? Possibly. But even if it has, we have no reason to fear because Christ's return will mean our redemption. We have gospel hope for today because our sovereign Lord holds the future in his hand. And then the man of lawlessness. Other places in the scriptures talk about this man of lawlessness as the Antichrist. And we generally fixate on questions like, who is he and when will he arrive? But I'd like for us to take a different tack this morning. These headings are outlined in Andrew Young's commentary of 2 Thessalonians 2, and they help us here. They talk about the man of lawlessness, his description, his delay, and his demise. Who is he? He's a son of destruction or perdition, the passage says. He sets himself up against any and all authority. He opposes worship. More specifically, he opposes anyone else to be worshipped besides himself. He sets himself up in the temple. He proclaims to be God, Skip down to verse 9, let there be no mistake, the coming of the man of lawlessness is the activity of Satan, power, false signs, wonder, wicked deception, strong delusion. In many ways, the, the man of lawlessness is the embodiment of the rebellion that we talked about earlier. He puts himself in the place of God. And here's where other parts of the Bible are helpful for us. Remember what John says in 1 John Children, it is the, hour, the last hour so that you have heard that Antichrist is coming. So now many, many Antichrists have come. And when we think through Bible prophecy and predictions, it's important for us to remember that prophecies usually had implications and applications for the original hearers. For example, Revelation is not just a book about the future. 
and the end of the world. It was a gospel hope message for first century Christians. And so there have been predictions like this about the man of lawlessness that go back to the Old Testament. We read about it in the book of Daniel. And that was partially fulfilled in 169 B.C. when the temple was desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes, a Syrian king who sacrificed a pig on the altar in Jerusalem. Something similar happened with the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. There are many antichrists throughout history. We know there have been people who have set themselves up as God. They may have done great things, but they feed and thrive on worship. Again, Paul says, I told you about this. Don't let it derail you. Don't be shaken or alarmed. First things first. The second thing we see about this man of lawlessness is that he is delayed. Even with his power and deceit, the man of lawlessness will be delayed. As a representative of Satan, he wants to kill and steal and destroy, but he's still restrained. He's still on a leash in terms of timing and scope. We saw this principle with Satan and Job. Remember, God allowed Satan to go so far with Job and no further. The man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, can go so far. And we don't understand why this is part of God's plan, but we do know we are reminded to have gospel hope for today because our sovereign Lord holds the future in his hands. And he will be destroyed. The man of lawlessness has power. He will wreak havoc. But at just the right time, Jesus will kill the man of lawlessness with the breath of his mouth. And what a picture of the power and sovereign rule of our God. It is nothing for Jesus to take him down. What is the application for us? What could possibly be the application for us this morning? Well, think about it like this. Are you wrestling with God's purpose and plan? Are the circumstances of your life confusing and overwhelming? Are you tempted to stray or rebel against the Lord because you're scared or angry or afraid? Are you overwhelmed with evil and injustice in the world? Maybe the evil of powerful people in particular? Are you simply struggling with the impact and ravages of life in a fallen world? Remember, we have gospel hope for today because our sovereign Lord holds the future in his hands. And yes, there's some... These are some of the first things that must take place, and even if they do take place, even if we have to walk down darker roads than we thought or have to face harder days than we ever imagined, God is with us. Satan is bound. Evil is on God's leash. Again, God said all of this would happen. Paul told them. The prophets foretold it in the Old Testament. Jesus alluded to it. What does Psalm 46 say? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains are cast into the heart of the sea. Even if the wheels fall off in our lives and we're overwhelmed with fear and doubt and pain and life and hurt and disappointment and suffering, God is our proven refuge. He's our rock our fortress, and our strong tower. The third thing we see from this passage is gospel hope for today despite the downward spiral. You know those things at the mall? It's essentially a big funnel, and you drop a penny or a quarter in it, and it slowly circles around, and it goes down further. It gets faster and faster and faster. It's a downward spiral. And in some sense, That describes the last part of this passage. We can have gospel hope for today even in the face of a downward spiral of deceit and condemnation. The man of lawlessness will have evil power, exhibiting false signs and wonders with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. This reminds us how God describes the downward spiral and dehumanization of sin. Part of the punishment for sin and unbelief is God giving folks over to the very things that they're pursuing. They get exactly what they want, and that's the picture here. For those who do not believe, things go from bad to worse. They'll become more and more deceived, entrenched in a strong delusion that they are what matter most, that there's no need to repent of their sins 
and believe the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a strong delusion to believe what is false. Those will be condemned who do not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Here's the thing, and here's the reality. There is a movement away from God and away from Christ in this world. It shouldn't shock us. And it's rooted in two deceptions. First, there's an unwillingness to believe and accept the truth, that there is one true and living God, the creator and sustainer of the universe. And even though we've sinned against him in thought, word, and deed, he's provided a way of escape, a path of redemption through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Even though that message is clear and powerful and free, the downward spiral of sin and deception means people won't believe. The second downward spiral of sin means that people take pleasure in unrighteousness. That's what it says in verse 12. They take pleasure in unrighteousness. And we know that there is passing pleasure in sin, but it's ultimately destructive and dehumanizing and selfish. It's fleeting pleasure. It's empty. And we've all seen this before with addiction, where people essentially say, I know it's unhealthy. I know I'm killing myself slowly, but I can't stop and I won't stop. I want what I want, and I want it now. It feels good, so I'll do it. I don't care about the consequences. And man, that's depressing. How in the world can we have gospel hope despite the downward spiral of sin and deception? There are a couple ways. First, we are here because God intervened in our lives. We were on the path of destruction, the road to perdition. We were deceived. What we believed and how we lived and what we thought was most important would bring us true happiness. We were deceived about all those things. And we said, essentially, I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. But because of the saving, regenerating work of the Holy Spirit of God, we now can say, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. My life is hidden with God in Christ. I'm a child of the King. Take heart. Have gospel hope for today because God is still rescuing people whose hearts are darkened and deceived. We have the privilege to carry his message of grace to our families and our neighbors and our friends and our co-workers, knowing that God is still breathing life into spiritually dead souls he's bringing dry bones to life have gospel hope today in that reality and as we double down in gospel hope for today we need to remember that we can be deceived by at least two lies mentioned earlier we can be deceived by the lie that says what we believe doesn't really matter it's possible to start with gospel hope but if we don't camp out there and live there We can slowly drift away from our anchor, our mooring, our foundation. And when we do that, we either disengage with the beautiful truths of the gospel and the doctrines of Scripture, or we can become more and more rigid and self-righteous like the Pharisees. And that happens because we drift away from the gospel and the hope of the gospel. It results in a departure of gospel hope for today. We can also fall into the lie that says what we do doesn't really matter. There's a deceptive pull in the life of believers to let sin take root, to let it live in us and with us. We're forgiven and accepted. God understands it's no big deal. Just do what you want. And before we know it, we can find more pleasure in unrighteousness and shut out those who speak truth into our lives and walk in rebellion. That's why gospel hope for today must remain front and center in our lives to help us move forward in mission and gospel living. Eschatology is a big fancy theological word that means a study of the end times. What is our takeaway this morning? What do we do with a passage like this? Well, we could get all caught up in the details, or we could gloss over them completely. Or we could take our cue from the Apostle Paul 
Don't be alarmed. Don't be shaken. Even though there are hard and challenging realities in the future, you can have gospel hope for today because the sovereign Lord holds the future in his hands. Theologians call this eschatological living. We look back at what God has done, redemption, salvation, deliverance, and the empty tomb. We look now at his faithfulness in the presence, how he gives us more than we could ever ask or imagine. And we look forward in hope for the return of our faithful Savior. We keep our eyes on the celestial city, on the coming of the kingdom, on the blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, with our eyes on the prize with our, with our eyes on the victory, our suffering is put in perspective. Our fears fall to the wayside. Our doubts dissolve in the glorious love and everlasting victory of King Jesus. May God grant us gospel hope for today as we look to our sovereign Lord who holds the future in his hands. Let's pray. God, we commit ourselves to you. We commit our lives to you. I pray that if there are those with us listening, worshiping, who are having questions about your love or have doubts about your plan, would you comfort them, quiet their fears? Would you work in us to believe that you are good and that we can have gospel hope today? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing song is I Will Wait For You, which is an uh, adaptation of Psalm 130. Let's sing I Will Wait For You. <laughs>
The benediction is God's blessing, his smiling face upon his children. So I invite you to reach out your hands and lift up your eyes to receive the benediction from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Go in God's peace.